Even men at the top of their game find themselves wanting more from life, whether it's more meaning, unshakable confidence, a bigger impact, more money, deeper love, a hotter sex life, or a powerful legacy. Find out how good your life can be on this episode of Man Alive. Also, as I've supported men in their love and work lives for 15 years now, many men ask for the right words to say to be more successful, attractive, and desirable. But I found it's not so simple as giving scripts or lines because every man is different. So giving words or scripts would be like giving a tall, thin man a shorter, wider man's pants or vice versa. The words have to make sense for you and your personality, and there's so much happening beneath the surface that people are responding to. If you're interested in how to become a better lover and leader in your own unique way, go to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz, or you can text ALIVE to 44144. It only takes a couple minutes, and you'll start to get an idea of how you can be both more respected and desired. After you fill it out, we can schedule a time to review your quiz and talk about your specific challenges and desires. So again, go to either shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text ALIVE to 44144. That's A-L-I-V-E to 44144. Enjoy this episode of Man Alive. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Man Alive. I'm here today with Michael Holt. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Good to be here. So excited to talk today about some paradoxes, right? Your business is called, or your practice is called the savage and the saint. And we're going to talk about those two, as well as vulnerability and strength and power and receptivity. And, you know, the more um, personal growth work, spiritual work I do, the more I really get that things that once seemed paradoxical, right? Things that seemed opposites, are now, um, you know, they're occurring at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think especially for men, this idea of I'm supposed to be strong or I need to be powerful, you know, sometimes men come to me thinking that vulnerability is the opposite of that, that there's a weakness or a, you know, there's a, it's a way of collapsing or falling down. And, you know, that's not how I see it at all. And I don't think that's how you see it. So I'm excited to dive into this topic with you as a martial arts teacher and, you know, practitioner and, and really get your perspective on this. Yeah. Happy to share. Thank you. So for those who don't know you, I'll give you a quick intro and then we'll dive in. Michael is a guide in vitality and consciousness. Some of the most elite performers in the world. His extensive background in meditation, martial arts, Western psychology, health and wellness, and exercise science combined to form a unique mind-body pedagogy that is trusted by executives, founders, athletes, artists, and entertainers who are committed to excellence in all areas of their lives. He lives in Venice, California, where he devotes his time outside of his private practice and group facilitation to meditation, martial arts, and wellness study as well as writing and shamanic training. So beautiful. It's a, such a wide range. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with the savage and the saint? I'm imagining there's a story there. Sure. Yeah. I was just really informed by my life experience. Um, as a young man, uh, I'm not sure that I, um, inherited the tools for emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that led me down a path of uh, machismo, um, a cloak of machismo to hide how I was really feeling. Yeah. Um, regulating painful emotions with uh, alcohol and fighting. I had a rambunctious uh, youth, my late teens and early 20s, and it led me to a place of just, wow. Wow this is really hard. Life is really hard. I don't think I can keep doing this. Yeah. And um, I have a meditation teacher who says that individuals who are called to deep meditation practice, deep contemplative practice, deep introspection, typically come from uh, the extreme ends of the continuum. If we extrapolate a population along a bell curve, in the middle, we have most people, things aren't so good, things aren't so bad life is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. There's no real call to dive deep change or yeah, go deeper. Mm -hmm. 
at the foot, one far end of the ex- continuum is people who are super successful uh-huh. from the external view. They have it all. They've mm-hmm. done what they set out to do yet. Still they're left with this. This can't be it. This right. cannot kind be it. Emptiness but, uh, or longing feel fulfilled here. Mm-hmm. And the opposite end of the extreme is I can't get in the, I can't seem to get in the game. Yeah. Life is so challenging. My internal landscape is so challenging. I don't love myself. I, I don't have the energy to keep going. Yeah. That's where I came to the meditative path. Mm. Um, I was suffering enough that meditation seemed like a good idea. Like, wow. Well, God damn, I guess I'll give it a try. With the, you know, I, I'm I'm a long term long time meditator as well, but the funny it's a funny term to hear meditation seem like a good idea, right? Because for most people, meditation is like the last thing that anybody wants to do. Right, right. Right. It can feel that place of suffering, right? You know, and, and I had that in myself too, I think, when it came to meditation of something's gotta give, something's gotta change, can't keep going in this way. And you know, right. that powerful decision and you know the i think for some people who haven't really um engaged the practice meditation can be thought of as this uh hippy dippy airy fairy love and light yeah. kind of exploration that's not my experience it's in my experience it's a direct confrontation with your suffering mm. and for that reason Woo. well I like, said i like to share um the contemplative path with the men who feel called to work with me as the real warriors work. Yeah. You know, we live in a society where the primary means of emotional regulation is distraction. Yep. There's a million things you can do to uh, distract yourself from how awful you feel. Yeah. Or, you know, or to how confused you are about life. life. What, is, what is happening here? What yeah. is happening here? Yeah. Or you can summon the courage of the warrior to just sit and grapple with those existen- mm. existential questions, those big just, questions. Yeah, direct confrontation with your suffering, right? I, it takes that kind of warrior stamina, right, mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, and so I engaged the practice. I read some books. I cultivated a daily practice. I sought out some teachers. And um, at one point, I felt called to explore meditation retreat practice which is you know a period of a few days or weeks or even a whole month of just silence just sitting yeah and you know i would tell people i'm going away on a meditation retreat i would have to put my affairs in order because i would be right you know, off the grid for two weeks three weeks four weeks and people would say oh man that must be nice i wish i had that kind of time oh god uh, and I would, in my head, I would say, yeah, I'm not sure it is what you think it is. Oh, I, well, I remember even from doing the, a 10 Even, days, even yeah. the phrase retreat. I don't like that phrase retreat because no, it's not retreat a retreat. implies a stepping back. Yeah. But really, it's a, it's a hard Coming charge right forward. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard charge forward into human existence. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's the warrior's path, the real warrior's path. Yeah. Well, I appreciate, I can feel your depth and, you know, where you sit and the the place that you see from. And I think for many humans, right, the idea of confronting the suffering feels terrifying or uncomfortable or, you know, any of those things confusing, like mm-hmm. you said. And so I'm appreciating you guiding well, people into those places. Sure. And I'm fortunate that I found people to guide me into those places. So I'll just pay it forward. But, um, you know, you're going to have to do that sooner or later. We're all going to have to do it sooner or later. We're going to be left alone with ourselves. Yeah. Um, I think the wise choice is to uh, do that while you're still alive and well and healthy. Yeah. In some ways, I I like to think of meditation as a preparation for dying. Yeah for death Mm -hmm. and it's the uh, practice of having a good death of being ready and actually through direct experience confronting that reality that the self is not permanent right Um, it's not an illusion it's real the self it comes and goes but if you get concentrated enough you can see it come and go yes great liberation there as the practice deepens and the perspective shifts you start to see your own mind your own self 
from the bird's eye. And from that perspective, you you're, find yourself in an empowered position to cultivate a self yeah. that, is, that is beautiful, that is right. pleasant, and that is aligned with the deepest calling of mm. your soul. So beautiful, right? There's there's definitely a sense. I've had this, many of my clients had this, that we're just, you know, we're given a self or we're given a personality and mm -hmm. to actually have the capacity to step back enough to witness and to, like you said, create a self rather than identifying with the patterns and habits that we've built up over time is powerful. And, you know, I'm thinking, right. So it takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage to sit in that quiet place and not run. Right. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that in terms of vulnerability as well, right? That sense that a lot of men have that there's a softness or a kind of weakness in vulnerability as opposed to that it's actually part of strength for the way I see it. Yeah, I would agree with you. I would say it's really the highest expression of strength is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You used a word in the introduction, men, men uh, feel you said something like collapsing into vulnerability is weakness. Yeah. I would say that collapsing into vulnerability is weakness. Mm. The very subtle distinction um, when it comes to vulnerability is strength is not collapsing into your trauma. Yeah. But holding it, feeling it with your shoulders back, chin tucked and deep breathing and allowing it to be there without mm. needing be any different you start to metabolize yes. all that gunk that we accumulate through our you know from childhood to becoming adult and nobody gets gets through that process unscathed so the mm -hmm. the contemplative practice is the one of turning toward and allowing for the metabolization of those uh emotion that emotional residue that if you're not aware of it it doesn't mean that it's not puppeting you and dictating your course of action in the puppeting. world. Puppeting, Yes. That's a and really good way to say it. The degree to which you're not aware of your own stuff is the degree to which your stuff is leaking out of you on the people in your life who you love. Right. Right. So I think the our, one's real responsibility is to heal, to mm. heal yourself. And if everyone took upon that responsibility, the world yeah. would change dramatically but we can't force people to do it. All oh, we have one mind, one heart, one body, one breath that is our responsibility. And if you take radical responsibility for your little corner of creation and make yeah. it beautiful, the world becomes more beautiful. Yeah. And I know when I work with men, you know, sometimes it's meditatively, sometimes it's awareness or relational awareness is kind of like a relational meditation, you know, as those patterns and habits become clearer as the the ways of leaking like become part of their you know conscious awareness right relationships start to change they can feel more you know full of life and vitality and spark again there's more they can receive love and give love and you know their sex life becomes more passionate there is so many beautiful things happen i'm curious if you can speak to what you see um you know, with your clients, what happens for them? Sure. Well, you know, as you engage the healing practice of um, allowing your own wounds to surface and uh, heal, you become a space of healing for the people in your life. Mm -hmm. So you have the space to heal, to hold not only your own stuff, but um, the pains of the people in your life. You become the medicine. You become uh, healing just by your presence. You don't have to say anything or do anything. You don't have to fix anyone. Yeah. It's just this subtle shift in your vibe that's felt by, okay, this person has the space for me to share how what's really going on for me. And that's the highest, that's the highest calling of service. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say a thing, just your presence becomes the medicine. Yeah. Right. I love that. And, and, you know, on a surface level, I talk about it as invisible influence, right? There's this way that we influence people with our presence, whether we're speaking or not, whether we're even sometimes even looking at a person or not. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's interesting to, again, look at the paradoxes, or in this case, it's like the, the surface level of what happens and the depth, you know, at the, the deep, deep levels, what happens as well. When, with regard to presence, I like to talk about your presence like a song. Mm. 
Mm. And, you know, we're all, we, we are all a song and we're contributing to the great song universe, one song. Yeah. So the practice, the, the practice of healing, the inner work is the practice of making your song pleasant. Mm. And it, if you're not aware of yourself at the deeper, deeper levels, then your song can be dissonant. This, I was going to say discordant or dissonant. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it, whether you're aware of your presence or not, it's affecting the space around you. Yeah. And so the degree to which you start to become aware of that mm-hmm. is the degree that you can start to intentionally play your song sweetly. You don't have to open your mouth. No. Your presence speaks volumes before you say a word. Yeah. I used to do this exercise with men when I was uh, a woman facilitator uh, for a workshop, you know, a team of people. And the men would come in and do this silent approach exercise and Mm -hmm. in you know 30 seconds or so right even five seconds but we would give them like 30 seconds or so just to stand in front of us and it was incredible you know what we could feel whether there was shame or disdain or nervousness or sadness or grief or like just having them stand there in front of us right sure we could yeah that's why those practices are very powerful We do similar stuff in the international men's community that I've built. When you open the space and make the agreement that, okay, I'm going to tell you how I feel about you. I'm going to tell you what everyone else thinks, but polite society doesn't. Or won't tell you. Yeah, because polite society doesn't allow for that kind of communication. Yeah. Let me tell you how you make me feel before you ever open your mouth. And that, that can be a light bulb moment for a lot of guys wow, I, I really am affecting a space just by being there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That we have, I mean, it's so powerful to see that we have such a powerful impact, right? At first it can feel like, oh no, you know, I'm not having the impact I want to have, but then to actually realize that we have control over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What do you feel like are some, um, or, you know, what's one of the the shifts that you've seen in yourself or, you know, something that, that you feel most meaningful as a result of doing your own practices? Um, that's a great question. I would say the shift, the most profound shift that I could speak to at this point is the shift from discipline to harmony. Hmm. And discipline is the necessary starting point of a healing journey. You know, you have to cultivate the strength to do things, to will yourself to do things that you may not want to do. Right. Um, Things that you are being told are good for you, but it requires some discipline to actually get it done. But as you start to engage these practices, um, authentic self-love starts to emerge. Mm -hmm. You start to care for yourself the way you would care for someone that you love. As you can start to see yourself more from the bird's eye of awareness, somehow you look at yourself less personally and you see yourself as a creation of source or of God. And so it's very um, natural to want to care for yourself. And that is the shift from discipline to harmony. Hmm. When one is living in harmony, the things that, that is best for you, eating well, practicing your breath, exercising, meditating, Sounds like they come more naturally. Yeah, the things that are best for you and the thing that you want to do start to become the same thing. So you're no longer white knuckling the practice. I have to do this. I must do this. Yeah. As it lands that, hey, you're looking at the man in the mirror and you say, you don't have to do a damn thing. Mm. You're perfect. I love you. That comes with an amazing uh, flow of energy mm-hmm. that then catalyzes your practice and because you recognize that you don't have to do anything, mm-hmm. the practice becomes much more seamless, much mm. less disciplined and much more harmonious. Mm. Right. It seems like it, it takes a lot less effort or efforting. Mm-hmm. And-, and, and as the practice deepens, one of the things that my, one of my meditation teacher, Shin Zen Young says, there's a figure ground reversal. Mm. So initially in the practice with regard to meditation, let's say, your 20 minute meditation period is something that happens during the course of your day. Mm -hmm. 
but with continued practice, with some retreat practice, as you really start to cultivate the skills of the meditator, the shift starts to occur where your day is something that starts to arise within the context of your constant meditation practice. Ooh, I love that. Mm-hmm. So it's your being, you're being meditated. You know, you've, you've showed up to the practice time and time again. These skills now have a life of their own and they're always on. Yeah. But you're being meditated by nature. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and, you know, when I'm working with men as this, you know, while we don't do, um, you know, day long, month long retreats, right. But they, but there is a, a deepening of consciousness and awareness mm-hmm. Yeah. and then standing in front of another person, whether it's a business partner or a romantic relationship, right. There's so much more of that. You were saying there's so much more of that flow, less efforting, more of an ability to actually touch each other, right? Like sure. not just but, physically, but in right. those deeper ways. Right. Because you're actually there. Yeah. You're, you know, that's the practice of meditation really in a nutshell is it's training the mind to abide in the present moment Yeah. so that when you encounter someone, the totality of your consciousness is there with them. It's very mm-hmm. penetrating. Yes. And yes. it's felt, it's felt Um, wow, this person is, they're not thinking about 12 other things and listening to me and thinking about what they're going to say next. They're here. And that can be a little destabilizing if you encounter somebody who's actually here because presence evokes what's true. Right. It's difficult to hide what you're feeling when you're in the presence of someone who's really seeing you. Mm -hmm. But that's the medicine. Yeah, I love what you said before, right? You can become the medicine instead of being that, you know, I don't think we gave the opposite example, right? But there are people and you can see this, um, you know, there are people who walk into a room and suddenly there is more fear or more anger or more more of that discord, right? And then there are people who walk into a room and suddenly there is more connection or more. Sure, well, I think, I think maybe the opposite would be um, trying to fix the problem that's in front of you, uh, uh-huh. staying in your head, being really heady. Oh, well, you're not feeling good. Well, have you tried X, Y, and Z, or you should do this rather than just allowing the truth of the moment to be there. You know? I'm curious. Cause, um, I love that too, you know, in relationship, do you have experience of being with that? Do you have a partner or a romantic partner? Another partner. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm just curious about, you know, how that's showed up for you in whether it's friendships or business relationships or romantic relationships you've ever had. Mm-hmm. Cause a lot of men, one of my clients recently just said like, Oh, I made that shift from trying to fix things mm-hmm. to what it's like to actually listen and to actually be there. And I'm curious if you have those experiences and, and what that's been like. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that for a man, you could say that a man's emotional reality is his feminine side. Mm. And as he learns to allow his emotion to exist and pay attention to it without needing to fix it, stuff it down or distract himself to it, but just be with it and allow for the liberation of what he's holding on to, that is then mirrored in the people. Uh, in his relationships with the people in his life, be it his yeah. romantic partner, his children, his employees, or whoever. Yeah. And sh- of course, I've had those experiences. Um, I'll tell a story. Just to give an example, I was in the grocery store, waiting in line. I had just come from a meditation retreat, and I was in practice for two weeks, mm-hmm. and I was very still. Mm-hmm. You know, the practice was still percolating in me and I get to it's my time at the checkout line the grocery store woman goes through the compulsory hi hey how are you how are you doing and I said oh I'm doing well how are you but it wasn't compulsory I was I was there you were really there the the pattern interrupter for her I could feel it she was a little okay and shocked yeah and she started to cry Mm -hmm. she just started to cry and said um actually, uh, I'm going through it, uh, going through a divorce and I'm worried about my kids and she, I'm just there, you know, I'm not weirded out by this at all. I'm here for it. 
And then she starts to collect herself and pull herself back in and starts to apologize for a, an experience that she doesn't have an explanation for. Mm-hmm. And I say, it's totally okay. You know, don't worry about a thing. And I collected my groceries and went away. But that's just an example of when, when, you, when you encounter present. presence, yes. you can't hide. You can't hide what's true. And I didn't give her any advice and tell her about her divorce or what she should do. That's not what she needed. Right. She just needed somewhere to. Yeah. Release, let it go. Let it go. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Feel what she was feeling instead of doing all the tensing and holding and avoiding and trying to so that's get just around one it. Small example, but that, that becomes the way that you are. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, recently in my relationship, you know, I've been, I told you, right. I've been going through my homeschooling, my kid, my mom has just had heart surgery. There's a lot going on and there's so much intensity. And I actually was sitting the other day realizing that I was feeling kind of dead. Mm -hmm. Like all the air was just sucked out of this vacuum. And then suddenly I realized that there was just rage and anger and all kinds of intensity there that I didn't want to feel because I felt like, well, that makes me a bitch or that makes me a nasty person or that makes me, you know, and my partner amazingly has the capacity to just sit in that presence and just be with mm-hmm. right that without the judgment, without trying to fix it. And right. It's, it's such a, um, it's like a bomb for the soul to be able to be seen and understood with that depth of acceptance and just, you know, presence. And right. I, I think if that could happen more, you know, everywhere, right? Parenting, you know, I think about romantic relationships, if that could happen more between two people or between people, uh, I just think it would have such a a huge impact on how, you know, how we then bring ourselves to the world. Absolutely. But until you can offer yourself that presence, you you just don't have the capacity to offer it to anyone else. So the entirety of the path is your relationship with you yeah if that becomes stronger and you give yourself the permission to feel and be whatever you are and be authentic yeah. then you can offer that to to the others yeah that's beautiful right which is a good incentive for any man or any human mm-hmm. right to start actually allowing for and finding guides and mentors to help with that that self-love and self-acceptance mm-hmm. yeah what do you find? I know you said you work with, um, you know, elite performers. Mm-hmm. What would you say some of the barriers are, you know, that you've had to walk them through on this well, path? <clears throat> I think to gain um, the title of being elite in anything, you may need to ignore your inner world for a, a period of life and chase something that's external mm-hmm. and to become highly successful that's par for the course in our modern society. And so when I work with someone who's achieved, you know, great wealth or great success in their field, that's often come at the expense of um, their own self relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think the commonality, the common thread that I would find with the highly functioning people that I work with is that their, their life is out of balance. Mm -hmm. They've gone so far into some external pursuit, and they've ignored their what really nourishes them. Yeah. So it's a it's a calling back into your breath, into your body, into your being. Yeah. And finding there what you thought you would get from this pursuit that you went on. Mm-hmm. You know, the things that we really want, we can give ourselves right now. Happiness, peace, contentment, gratitude. They're all skills that take practice. And if you're not practicing them, they don't just befall you. But you can learn to incline your mind toward those, uh, what they call in Buddhism, the Brahma Viharas, yeah. um, the boundless states, compassion, joy, equanimity, mm-hmm. love and kindness. You can, you can practice those things so that they become the, the new default. And there's mm-hmm. no opportunity. One of the things I'll often say, there's no option not to practice. We're always practicing something. Every moment of every day, we are getting better at something. Yeah. 
practice is to start to become aware of what are you getting more efficient at? Mm. How is that making you feel? Are you getting more efficient at avoidance? Are you getting more efficient? At- are you getting more efficient at comparison, anger, anxiety? Yeah. You know, let's have a look. Where does your mind go when you're not there, when you're on autopilot? Yes. When you're sleepwalking through your waking life, what are you, what skills are you cultivating? Mm. And how is that working for you? Yeah. Let's try to cultivate these skills. See mm. how that works for you. And initially mm. it feels forced and fake, but with continued effort, it becomes the new normal. Mm-hmm. You watch your mind just spontaneously offer phrases of love and kindness or joy or compassion. It's mm. your mind becomes, if you engage the practice, it's the kind of like the practice of training a dog and yeah. the puppy of your mind does it behave is it the kind of puppy that goes and gets the newspaper for you and makes your life more beautiful yeah. or is it chewing your sofa peeing on your couch you know <laughs> is it making your life more complicated is it making your life yeah, more yeah. challenging than it has to be yeah. so go in train you know mm-hmm. practice become aware of what you're practicing prevent the mind from practicing the negative afflictive stuff and teach it to practice the good stuff. Mm. There's no opportunity not to practice. There's no option not to practice. We're all practicing something. Mm. Thank you so much for this deep dive. And any last thing you want to communicate? We're we're finished already. I know it it goes by, right? We were so present that it's like a half hour is gone. Yeah. So we didn't really even touch on the uh, martial art aspect. Yeah. But I find that for me, that was, um, look, anyone who dedicates themselves to martial art, I think if they're really honest with themselves, they will admit to you that what got their foot in the door was fear, insecurity, machismo. For me, it's totally true. I wanted to be the badass in the room. A a deep, fearful, uh, afraid part of me needed to know that if something happens, nobody's messing with me. I'm the tough guy. And so you learn, you engage these skills, you, you know, martial art is the practice of becoming efficient in violence. To gain any skill in violence, you have to take some lumps on the way in the gym, right? So it's a very humbling uh, process. The paradox of the martial art path taken with integrity is when you get to the point where you could really do some damage, Mm. um, peace has emerged and you don't ever even think about, you know, taking it there. Yeah. And so now you walk, I think that's particularly good medicine for a man because your presence says, without you needing to say a word, mm-hmm. I love you. Mm-hmm. I'm here to help you. Yeah. And I could really uh, hurt you. Right. <laughs> but, but I don't I want won't. <laughs> and I will hurt anybody who tries to hurt you. Yeah. And just the movement of martial art, you know, the movement, getting in there, sparring, hitting the bag for a man or a woman, of course, that is an opportunity to just really dig into yourself. And it's a healthy outlet for some of the emotional gunk that you may have accumulated. It's a healthy container to express that in a way that's not harming. Hmm. And I think my martial art path has placed me in a position to talk about meditation from more of a warrior Yep. where I say, okay, I'll give this a try. Right. So I can flip that, uh, that uh, preconceived notion of meditation as hippy dippy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now that's not me, but I can reach the tough guys, the convicts, the prisoners, the veterans, the fighters, yes. and they'll, they'll buy in. Yeah. And so that's what I feel mm. my, my calling really is to mm. share this contemplative work with populations of men who would otherwise just say nah that's hippie shit and it's not for me yeah yeah it's really beautiful right i i often i really appreciate you know strong men talking about things like meditation and vulnerability because sometimes when i say it it's like well of course she's saying that you know she's a woman or she's this or that and so right to to get it from the other side yeah so the savage and saint philosophy is you know have practices in place where you can really go into savagery and, mm-hmm. and express it and find mm-hmm. that not as an idea, no. but as, as, as a lived in your body, in yes. your spine, in your yes. bone marrow. 
and have practices where you can go all the way to the edge of what's comfortable for you in saintliness, hmm. kindness, unconditional love, peace. Then having explored the edges, live in the middle uh-huh. and wait for the moment to tell you what, she, what, what does she need? What's needed. Hmm. And then be that. Hmm. And when the moment changes, be something else. So we can become a shapeshifter and we can appear on that continuum wherever she, big she, right. needs to be. I love that too. And I love that, that it's not a shapeshifter from, you know, trying to please or fear or anxiety like certain, you know, like nice guys would imagine, right? That shapeshifter. This right. is a completely different shapeshifting from presence and attunement and, you know, being sure. actually in the moment. Yeah, and what I find in the work is some guys who come from the what I would call burning man spirituality, love and light kind of thing. Yeah. They have serious internal blockages around expressing savagery. Yeah. Because they were given messages maybe as a young boy that no, 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 that is bad. Aggression, yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, going after what you want, asserting yourself, no, no, no. That's not spiritual. Yeah. So for guys like that, some you know, martial arts drills might really be a little edgy, but would help them find that part of themselves. Flip side of the coin is guys who are super macho. You know, they, they look down at the burning man types. They're, they, they think of themselves as fighters, the internal meditative, more, uh, heart centered practices for them are very, yeah, they're, they're more edgy. Uh, I don't, that's not somewhere that I go. Yes. So we all have our own unique edges and hangups and the practice is to lean into the places that scare you. Hmm. I like that. Thank you so much for being here and where can men find you if they want more? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier, the men's community that I've built is called tribe and you can join us there at uh, tribemenscommunity.com. We're going to be hosting an, a virtual intensive uh, next month, November 13th, 14th, 15th. We're going to have guys from all over the world tune in. There's going to be two days of uh, deep practice. Um, they can find information about that on the website. My personal website is savageandsaint.com. I'm also on Instagram at Savage and Saint. So okay. I hope any man listening who is interested or intrigued by the things I've said would join us here at this upcoming intensive because it's going to be powerful. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you joined us for today's episode of Man Alive. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and it gave you something to consider and explore in your life. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful for you to subscribe and write a quick review that helps men like you find us. And again, head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz or text the word alive, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 to get a sense of how you can become a better lover and leader. You'll start to see how you can be both more respected and desired in your unique and genuine way. If you don't feel as confident or as excited about life or love as you'd like to be, this quiz is a really great starting point and will guide you toward a more passionate love life and a more inspiring and successful career. So again, text ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E, to 44144 or head over to shanajamescoaching.com slash quiz. Join us each week for a new episode of Man Alive.